Thank you. Okay, next we will meet with State Senator Julian Sear for a legislative update. Are you all right if we close the laptop? Oh, you're coming to pick oh, it up. Oh, it's okay. Even better. All right. It's, it's, it's all right if I just do that. that. Yeah, it's all right. Tom, can you put it on the shelf? So We've got plenty of room. We have our, just okay. our little iPads here. We're in good shape. <laughs> Once you close it, it just throws in for a loop. That's right. So he's got to start over. <laughs> I would like to thank our, our Senator Julian Sear and our Representative uh, Sarah Peake for joining us this evening to give us some updates for general items, but also some of the specific things that Orleans has been looking for from the state. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much uh, for having us here. Nice to meet some of the newer members of the board. You're hardly newer members anymore, and I apologize for this being really the first opportunity for us to officially shake hands and, and say hello to each other, but glad to be here this evening. Um, the senator and I have been doing a number of these things, and I want to give him credit and thank him for and his office for really uh, reaching out to the, the various boards of, of selectmen throughout my legislative district that I share with Julian, and uh, he's uh, been out on the islands and, and all over the place. So the way we usually do this is I'll begin, I'll talk about the home rule petitions that we're working on and kind of where those stand, um, and uh, follow up on some other sort of kind of granular uh, local stuff. So if I may, uh, <clears throat> what we have filed on behalf of the town that you've sent to us from town meeting for the 2017-2018 session uh, one bill in particular, House 2132, an act relative to abating a public nuisance on Cedar Pond. This was a refile, um, but you folks have settled that at the uh, doors of the courthouse. Knock, knock on wood. Knock on wood. It'll get done. Right. So, uh, you know, the bill had a hearing. There was an interest in, in moving it uh, through the House, but uh, based on the... Um, what we believe is a, a settlement. Now we just have to get mm -hmm. it done. Uh, I have asked the committee chairs to take no further action on the bill. So it's just sort of sitting there idly. We have a deadline coming up February 7th where all bills either have to move out of a committee, a few will be put on extension, or they get put into study. Study is a legislative euphemism for they die. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we will, uh, we're just going to kind of let that one fade, fade yeah. off into the sunset. But if you need the saber rattled again on that, it's something that we can absolutely uh, breathe life into again if, if you need, right. you know, something to hang over. They have ever, to have ever it finished by the end of 2018, okay. calendar year. Okay. So you'll be hearing from us if it Which slows since it's down. the beginning of that calendar year, we know that'll be here in the blink of an eye. That's right. <laughs> before, before we know it. Um, uh, another bill that we filed for you is House 2375, an act relative to the development of certain land in the town of Orleans. This was referred to the Committee on, Lake, uh, on Labor and Workforce Development. They held a hearing on it on October 3rd. You submitted written, written testimony to that. They haven't yet taken uh, further action on the bill. And if I'm remembering this correctly, I think this is a bill where you're looking for a waiver from the prevailing wage law. Right. Yep. And those are... So this is a refile also. Town right. meeting sent it to us uh, last time. And even with our own state senator as the Senate chair of the Labor and Workforce Development Committee, it was put into study. Um, we don't have the advantage of um, having our own state senator even chairing that committee anymore. These are, these are tough, tough bills. We got a lot of pushback from quite literally uh, the labor union movement, Boston labor in particular. Um, this is a little different from what we had some success doing in Chatham, because the case we had made in Chatham, it was for the Marconi Maritime Center, and we said that the town of Chatham was entering into a long-term lease with a nonprofit. So it was really the nonprofit that was doing the development of and renovation and restoration of that property. It wasn't the town itself. You know, the committee asked to see a lease. Um, it had to be a lease for a certain uh, term of a number of years, and we were able to get that through. This is not to say that either the senator and I are going to take our foot off the, the gas, <coughs> but I don't want to um, be a Pollyanna and paint an overly positive picture. Uh, this bill is, is somewhat of a heavy lift, quite, yeah. uh, quite honestly, is, is where we are with yep. that. Sir, on, on that bill, um, my office had reached out to the AFL-CIO on this just to get their perspective on it, um, and they... Uh, 
they, they appreciate that the language is written in a way um, that it doesn't adversely impact unionized employees. Uh, so the fact that they're not a hard no on this bill is, is a glimmer of hope. But I think the way that Representative Peake described this as a heavy lift is, is very accurate. All right. Uh, and lastly, the uh, third bill that we have in the hopper uh, this session is, act, uh, is House 3741. And these all just have House numbers, because the way Julian and I kind of work it is I'll file them on the House side first. Um, get things corralled, and then once the House enacts it, we send it, send it over to the, the Senate. No particular reason, it's just sort of out of habit that, uh, that that's how we do it. So House 3741, an act authorizing the Town of Orleans to enter into contracts for a sewer work system and operation. Uh, municipalities and regional government uh, heard this bill on the 27th of June. It was reported out favorably by the Municipalities Committee, and it is now in House Ways and Means. Uh, where it's being further reviewed and they take a look at any kind of financial impact. Um, on the House side, we had our longstanding chairman of House Ways and Means uh, leave this, uh, you know, resign from his, uh, not only his post as chair of Ways and Means, but resign from the legislature uh, in the sort of late fall, I guess. I can't remember the exact timing, sometime around late October or November. So Jeff Sanchez from J Jamaica Plains was appointed the new chairman. Um, he had a SUP budget, he had an end of the year budget to do, uh, any number of other things. Uh, he said to me once, it's like trying to sip water out of a fire hose, but now that he's had a chance to settle in, um, I'll be reaching out to, uh, to Chairman Sanchez to see um, what, he, what questions he may have, in which case I'll, I'll be back to your town administrator with those, or if no questions, let's get the bill, uh, get the bill moving along. And Ways and Means Committee, once a bill is there, it's not subject to this February 7th deadline. It's just leaving the initial committee. Um, and then I guess the other thing that I would like to, to uh, touch on, uh, some of us right in this very room met with the lieutenant governor when she was down on the Cape in August, I think it was the 22nd of August, to talk about the state-owned land that is in the state's right-of-way by the uh, exit 12, uh, exit off of uh, Route 6. The sense that I got from her is she is very interested in being helpful to the town in this way. Uh, Senator Sear was instrumental in getting a land transfer uh, off of Route 6 in Truro. And when we were at that uh, transfer, the undersecretary who has responsibility for MassDOT said to me, we are trying to find a way to get to yes on this. Um, I did reach out to the administration uh, today to see if there was any sort of update. I think they're more worried about this uh, hurricane, blizzard, snowstorm, deep freeze. <laughs> so I didn't hear back from them. Um, but that is something that absolutely uh, both the Senator and I will, will keep working on. And um, thanks to your great uh, presentation, you had your engineer here and everything. I, I think we really, we really caught her, her ear at that time. And very smart of you to hire an outside consultant that went to high school with her brother. That was, that was also uh, <laughs> help, helpful to the conversation as, as well. So um, uh, that's about it for, for my wrap up. I'll let the Senator take over and then we're happy to answer any questions you may have. And, and I think on the Exit 12 project, there's an understanding that you folks are gonna need an answer from the state um, sometime this winter because you have to pull things together for right. you know, your warrant. And so I think you know, this is something, I'm, I'm hopeful, Sarah's taking the lead on this. Um, but you know, certainly we're hopeful that we can get done. Just given if we can't get it done by a certain date, then it just means we're, you know, a whole further year out in your town meeting process. Um, so, so as Representative Peake said, uh, I've made it a point to make sure that I go to every single one of our board of selectmen uh, that I represent. I represent uh, 20 towns across Cape Cod, uh, Martha's Vine the six towns on Martha's Vineyard, uh, the town of Gosnell, which is actually the smallest town in the Commonwealth as well as Nantucket and most of the Cape Towns. Um, so actually, Orleans, you're, you're, you're my last stop on, on the, the sort of 2017 tour. Uh, please please uh, accept my apologies for being here three days late uh, into 2018. Um, but I think really it's critical. Uh, so many of the things that uh, we uh, try to do and often do in the legislature uh, are implemented uh, right here at the local level. I have a pretty keen appro uh, appreciation for that, having spent six years in public health where so many things that we do fall on your local boards of health. Um, and as we were just talking about, so many of the, the initiatives and priorities that the town wants to uh, make happen and get done um, flow through the Commonwealth in some way. And so I think that relationship is important, um, you know, certainly. Uh, and, and, and I've been meeting and talking with folks uh, on your board and, and, and part of Orleans, you know, throughout, throughout the year. Uh, so sort of at, at the 
uh, macro level in the State House, uh, a number of, uh, there has been a number of transitions, uh, this unexpected transitions in both houses this year. Um, but there are a number of priorities that I think we're going to continue to see some movement on that are really important for us here uh, on Cape Cod. Uh, housing production and a zoning reform bill, this was something that uh, actually Sarah is the sponsor of one of the proposals right. here. Uh, the acting Senate president today and gave a speech where she highlighted housing production as really something that we've got to address. Um, you know, here on Cape Cod, uh, this is a, 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 a tremendous concern for us. I'm really interested in how do we make sure that often a lot of the state programs for housing production are on a scale that's much bigger uh, than what we tend to do in our communities. Uh, so 200, 300 <coughs> unit developments just isn't what we see here. Uh, so how do we make sure that, um, uh, that we're tailoring things to smaller towns. Uh, so Representative Peake has a bill, uh, the Senate has a bill, uh, and then the governor filed a bill in December. Uh, I chair the Community Development and Small Business Committee, uh, which is one of the committees that has uh, sort of authority on planning issues, on zoning issues. Uh, so certainly <coughs> going to be taking a look at this. I'm actively involved in the Senate side. Sarah is on the House side. Uh, but, but optimistic that we're going to see something move. Um, in the fall, uh, both chambers took up a uh, criminal justice reform, uh, a pretty comprehensive effort. I think we're optimistic that we're going to see a um, uh, we're, we're going to see something emerge from committee. Uh, on the Senate side of things, we spent a decent amount of time sinking our teeth into health care reform, uh, looking at a whole host of policy changes uh, that are going to make a difference in health care costs for most germane for us here on the Lower Cape uh, as expansion of telemedicine a real look at how do you expand EMT services and reimbursement for those, how do you keep people out of emergency rooms and departments. The House is probably going to take this up sometime uh, this winter or spring. Uh, so, so, so those are sort of the big kind of headlines that we've been working on um, that impact the whole state. Uh, more closer to home, we've been really spending a lot of time as a delegation figuring out, you know, if you look at the, the, the twin challenges that we have here, uh, in my opinion, across the Cape, but especially in the Lower Cape, uh, it's housing and how that's very much tied to wastewater infrastructure. And under the 208 plan, uh, the Commonwealth is, is, is on the hook, is committed to uh, basically footing the bill for about a quarter of this, uh, so about a billion dollars over several decades. And, and you know, the delegation's been thinking about this long before I showed up, um, but we've been trying to think collaboratively about you know, how do we go about getting an appropriation, how do we go about getting resources for 15 towns, um, that, that basically is around 20, 20, maybe 25, almost $30 million uh, over multiple decades when appropriations, you know, year to year appropriations are just really tough uh, to get that level of support, especially for um, an area of the Commonwealth that is beloved, uh, but, I, but is more rural uh, and is seen, uh, I think a lot of folks see as a, as a quite privileged place uh, inaccurately. Uh, and so what we've been chewing on and trying to think about is what what sort of revenue uh, what revenue vehicles are, are are coming down the pipeline and how can we get dollars and resources from the state to municipalities like Orleans on wastewater uh, and so we think that we may have an opportunity and an opening um, with look uh, the legislature is looking at uh, room occupancy and the expansion of room occupancy to include short term rentals uh, Airbnbs VRBOs. Uh, weekly, monthly rentals. Uh, Sarah's been, been carrying the water on this uh, since the day you got to the, the State House. Um, and really, I think, thanks to her work, as well as an increasing realization in Boston that um, short term rentals, especially Airbnbs and VRBOs, are adversely impacting the rental markets and a whole list of factors. Uh, I think we're going to see some movement on this. The Senate's voted on this twice in our budget. Uh, the Speaker of the House has indicated his, his support of moving forward on something. Um, and the Governor has, has uh, mentioned his support of this as well. Um, and so Sarah can talk a little bit more if you want to get into the details of what the, the short-term occupancy expansion will look like. But we think with short-term occupancy expansion that this may be a way for us to um, sort of tie on uh, a, a set-aside amount of resources uh, or a percentage that would go to fund wastewater project or across Cape Cod and potentially Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard who have as significant of a wastewater need, um, they just aren't, aren't under court action. Uh, and so that is, we have a proposal, Sarah and I worked on a bill to create a Cape Cod Water Protection Trust. Uh, we have been revising that legislation, working collaboratively with the Treasurer's Office right. to really make sure that we're aligning 
uh, any sort of additional resources the state can give to uh, with the existing SRF and, and existing state programs that the Treasurer's Office and DEP manage. Uh, and so we're optimistic about this. If we're able to get this done, it would be a significant, a significant amount of aid to our communities. Uh, we're talking about um, an assessment akin to how large cities in the Commonwealth have financed their convention centers. So Boston, Springfield, and Worcester all have a 2.75 percent uh, surcharge on room occupancy in their communities. Uh, and we're thinking that we can make a similar argument um, both for existing room occupancy and then expanded room occupancy that we're going to see with short-term rentals. Uh, so, so lots to comment, you know, Alan McClellan and others have, have probably know more about this issue than, than, than certainly I do, um, but really want uh, the feedback from your community as we're looking at this legislation. Uh, this, this is in addition to, this would not take away from uh, the existing local percentage that you folks would get. I believe in Orleans it's 4%. Um, we know how important that money is to come back for, to you folks, to, you know, for you to spend as you see fit. Um, and so this would be an above and beyond uh, component. Uh, we've really had a lot of support from the business community. Uh, the Cape Cod Chamber in particular, I think, really realizes that uh, the economic future of the region, both in, in, in the seasonal uh, tourism engine that, that makes so much of our economy happen, uh, and then also more broadly when it looking, looking at new economic development and opportunity, is really tied to our ability to address wa wastewater, to have clean water, uh, to develop smartly. Uh, and so that is more to come on that, and we're glad to answer questions on that. Uh, it's an effort that the whole delegation has been working on. Um, we have a, a very bipartisan, collaborative delegation uh, of the eight of us who represent Cape Cod and the islands. Um, so that's sort of the kind of the biggest piece that's coming uh, in the next several months. Uh, timing, it could be as soon as the next several months or, or <clears throat> probably more likely during the budget process that we take up. But I, I, I'm optimistic that this is... Uh, something that could be very significant, uh, especially for a town like Orleans, which has been doing the work, putting in the planning. Uh, you're getting to a point where you have some, um, you may have some shovel-ready projects, projects that would benefit from this. What did I leave out? That's perfect. Questions? Yes. Mark. Julia, in regard to the, the um, legislation that you were just talking about, is there would it be fair for us to to assume that if and when something comes forward that allows the towns to generate income from these short-term rental properties, that we're not going to lose uh, a large amount or a large percentage of the money that would be generated from rentals within a town to some bureaucracy or general Fund. I mean, is I mean that's part of the. Well, you know that as well as I yep, do. No, the, 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 the bitch has always been, the, the gripe has always been that that uh, the Cape pays much more to the state than they get back. So, yep. is, is this something that we that we can feel comfortable with in terms of? You start and I'll wrap up. Um, that was sort of that was a concern of mine from, from day one in looking at this in, in, in a number of these proposals. Um, actually, this started off with the proposal to have something much broader to have a, 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 a countywide infrastructure bank, which just seemed uh, too sort of broad, um, not specific enough. Uh, and in all the iterations we've been working on, really making sure that dollars are um, very much earmarked uh, to come directly back here and actually. In one proposal, the original proposal that, that we had worked on that I had filed in the Senate budget created a, a CAPE-based board and, and a, a essentially a, a trust staff to administer that with right. a cap. By working with the Treasurer's Office, we're basically eliminating that. Um, so there's very little to no overhead, essentially using existing state resources like the, tre the Treasurer's Office and the SRF to, to basically turn around the dollars. Uh, we've also, we're also working on language to make sure that towns uh, get back what they put in. Uh, I think Orleans, because you folks are um, uh, further along the way in, in actually wastewater planning, I think you may benefit from this sooner <coughs> rather than others. Um, but I think there is a realization, I was at the Truro Board of Selectmen last meeting last month, uh, you know, and, and the Select Board in Truro was saying how, you know, look, it's really important for us that Orleans uh, you know, has a vibrant downtown and there's housing. You know, we really rely on, you know, 
what, what from Charles' perspective is the sort of metropolis of Orleans here, um, <laughs> you know, to do our shopping, to do a whole host of things. It's, so it's the hub. That's it is right. the hub. That's right. right. Um, you know, so, 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 so I, I definitely share that concern, Mark. Uh, and I think uh, by doing this in this way, uh, like the convention centers and others, um, it really helps mitigate uh, the penchant that we have in the legislature to stick our fingers into dedicated pots of money further down the road. Right. Yeah, it was really enlightening when we met with the woman who runs the State Revolving Fund, which is the existing fund under the umbrella of the Treasurer's Office that already administers the low or no interest, uh, no interest loans uh, for wastewater funding. You know, some 10 years or so ago, I worked with uh, Senator Rob O'Leary to uh, create an opportunity for Cape communities to avail themselves of money at 0% interest, um, which, which was a great thing. Um, but if we have a way to uh, find a designated revenue stream, and in effect, have the people who come here as our visitors for <coughs> whom we build infrastructure, help pay for that oversized infrastructure. Uh, I mean, Orleans is really no different from a province town. Uh, tonight, uh, the number of people who are using, would, would be using a wastewater treatment plant is, you know, probably one fiftieth of the number of people that would use a wastewater treatment plant on Fourth of July weekend, for example. So, um, uh, at any rate, the meeting that we had with State Revolving Fund folks was, was very interesting because we were kicking these ideas around because uh, Selectman Matheson, as, as you brought up, the rap has always been no MWRA for Cape Cod. And I think that was a uh, code for we don't want 50 cents on the dollar to be going to salaries and pension benefits and health insurance and all of that for a, a very large infrastructure. So we're, we are keenly aware of that. So as we were struggling with what exactly, who would administer this, how do the towns all have say, um, uh, this woman uh, from the SRF said, well, we're in the business of collecting money and turning it around and issuing it again, and we can just kind of do that. Why don't you create an advisory board where all of the, the communities on the Cape and the islands will have a seat at the table to be making the decisions about who needs funding at what time, and in effect, the state treasurer's office would act as our bankers. But it would be every dollar raised here would be dollar every, would be a dollar that returns to the community, and the beauty of working collaboratively because we have been asked by various boards, well, why shouldn't we just go it alone? A community like Chatham, a community like Orleans, you're going to raise a fair amount of money if the uh, so-called Airbnb tax goes through. So why shouldn't you just keep what you raise? Like, what's in it for you to share with the other the other communities on the Cape? And there's a couple of things to share. Uh, first of all. Uh, the more money that goes into this trust fund, the more uh, we are able to leverage low interest loans that benefit all 15 towns and the islands. And to the degree there may be federal funding, uh, anytime there's a regional effort, you always move up on the, on the ranking in grant proposals in, uh, when, you, when you are working regionally as opposed to uh, you know, a, a small community having a go at it, uh, having a go at it on their own. So those are just two examples of um, why I think that uh, if we're all pulling from the same ore on this, it, it's going to be a benefit for, for our communities. Just, just as a little follow-up to that, so <coughs> I think the fear of a bureaucracy sucking in some of those dollars is one part, but as you said, if we can do this on a regional basis, I think the other fear might be that um, we generate a large amount of dollars from the rental businesses on the Cape and the islands, right. that there might be some other small communities that would be looking to, to get some of that money. Is, is, do you think it's, it's yeah. realistic we, to think that it would stay regional and yeah, would be strictly Cape Cod we, and islands? We think we have found a way to insulate this, uh, that it would go directly, in effect, into a trust fund at the treasurer's office, and we in the legislature couldn't get our sticky fingers on it. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. for example, there is a, um, uh, a tourism trust fund that every year the uh, regional tourism councils like the Cape Cod Chamber come and they say, hey, you know, percentage of all the room tax dollars that's generated, we are supposed, that's supposed to be returned to these 14 regional <coughs> tourism councils, and we don't see any money out of that. What are you guys doing? Well, the in enabling legislation uh, kind of 
puts it, in, it, it, not kind of, it does put it into the general fund and it says it's subject to appropriation. Mm -hmm. Well, the legislature makes a decision we're not going to appropriate it for that purpose because maybe we need to increase local aid or we want to do more with regional school transportation or pay for mass health or whatever it might be. So this uh, would not be money that is subject to appropriation, but absolutely uh, similar to the way with the existing room occupancy tax, there's a 5.7% share that goes to the state and up to 6% that the communities can opt in for. Uh, Orleans is in at 4%. That 4% local share, yes, it, it passes through DOR, but dollar into DOR is dollar out quarterly to the, the community, and that is, uh, that's our goal, and we, we feel confident we have a way to ensure that, too. Thank you. I think also for, um, by having all the towns being in it, you know, I, I, I'm mindful of, uh, <clears throat> there's communities like Orleans, uh, like Yarmouth, again, that's where we need to see sewering. Um, there's also communities, I, I think of uh, Sandwich and Mashpee, right, where, where uh, Mashpees and Baymonts are, are significantly impacted in part uh, by um, sort of up, up, upstream development in, in Sandwich. This allows Sandwich to pitch in or, or allows a town like Brewster, right, which may not need to see the sort of sewering that we're look like needing here uh, in Orleans, um, for have them to contribute to that as well. So there, there's an honestness about um, that, you know, the water table here, that the, the embayments that are watershed uh, you know, that, that doesn't follow the town boundaries that, that we set up several, you know, some several hundred years ago. Uh, yeah, just one other thing that I, I think it's important to understand. Uh, if this happens, there will be a percentage that goes into this fund and from all the towns every year. But it doesn't mean that all the money is there all of a sudden. So you've got a situation where this program could actually bond for the future and use mm. the income each year to, right. to retire the debt so that if there was a demand to do more work faster in the local communities, it could be done. You wouldn't have to wait for the, two, for the percentage to get, to get there. It, it's, and uh, having spent some time on this, I think we finally got to the point where it's, uh, it's for the Cape and uh, it's you know, the governor and the legislature and everybody signed the 208 plan and the <clears throat> commitment that at least 25 percent of the cost of that plan on the Cape was going to come from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And this surtax is a Commonwealth share and it's probably close to a billion dollars over 30 or 40 years. I mean, it, it's real money. And it's being created by the land uses that are creating the problem. So. Right. Yeah. Um, just to shift um, the subject a little bit to affordable housing, that, that was um, there, and I'm not sure who I'm addressing this to, but um, Orleans is in the process of exploring um, the creation of a uh, affordable housing trust. That, um, and um, what goes with that is the question of where the town might look to create a recurring revenue stream that, that, could, that could fund the trust. Does that subject ever come up uh, in, in your, in Boston, and do you have any um, ideas that you might be able to share with us? Yeah, it comes up not only in Boston, but here on the Cape, uh, town of Provincetown created an affordable housing trust. Uh, so far, it has uh, been funded solely through town meeting votes. We, the town has put, uh, I don't know, three quarters of a million dollars into it, uh, something like that. They're working on a rental property there. You've probably read in the Cape Cod Times. The uh, timeshare that went uh, bankrupt, uh, you know, they're looking uh, to gain ownership of that in bankrupt, out of bankruptcy and then do some renovations to it and offer it as rental housing. So there they're looking for rental income to help support at least that one property. Um, interestingly, I met with some uh, people from private investment firms just uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was before the, just before the Christmas break. Um, who work with nonprofit agencies to find uh, affordable capital uh, sources of income. So they were looking to move a piece of legislation. I think it's been filed by Rep Kulik already, who I do a lot of work with in the House. He's the, uh, the gentleman from Worthington, as they would say, at the State House. Uh, represents Worthington, a small town in the western part of the state. He and I co-chair on the House side, the Rural Caucus. 
um, I don't have all the details nailed down on it, but it's an intriguing way that I think uh, communities, as well as private developers, as well as organizations like the Lower Cape CDP, would have access to new capital at, at fairly at fairly low uh, low costs. There's a, a working group of people in Chatham, uh, one member of the Board of Selectmen, and several um, just citizens of Chatham who have uh, approached me, and I'm trying to put them together with the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, Jay Ash, to talk about how they want to work some public-private partnerships down there. So there's a lot of stuff sort of percolating up. None of it has really taken shape yet. Uh, I think if we do a major housing bill or major housing initiative, obviously funding has to follow that. And where the Senator and I have our work cut out for us, um, which he alluded to, is to make sure that that funding doesn't all just flow to urban areas, that uh, all the grants don't go to places that have a railroad train hub, for example, or an exit off of 495 or something like that, that uh, as those funds are being uh, parceled out and grant criteria are being written, uh, that we in these more rural areas are absolutely included, included in that as well. Yep. Uh, I should just add, Nantucket uh, has also filed a home rule petition to create um, a housing trust. Their mechanism to do it, uh, unlike Province Sounds, which is through appropriations by the town, uh, is a surcharge on the sale of um, properties that sell over $2 million, which they have quite a, bun a, a lot of on Nantucket, as, as we do in all, of, in all many of the communities I represent. Um, there'd be a 2% a, a surcharge that would then fund that. Uh, that's currently in committee. Uh, there's some opposition um, from, from the realtor community, uh, off-island realtors so from a Boston perspective. Or, uh, but that's another way to look at it. Uh, it seems that that is a heavier lift uh, than going the way that Province Sound has done it. Um, and Martha's Vineyard is looking at uh, having a, a, a similar, looking at it in, 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 as much as you folks are trying to figure it out here. Um, you know, I, I think I, I would call the attention to uh, the Cape Cod Commission study on housing, which is a fantastic document if you haven't seen it. Um, you know, and Orleans needs, you know, according to these estimates, an additional 197 year-round units by 2025. Um, you know, that, that's, that's a hefty number, but it's not 1,000 units. Um, it's not several. I mean, it's, we're around 200 units. Uh, one proposal that's being looked at in Oak Bluffs is actually uh, is a community like Orleans that has a denser downtown, uh, is rezoning to look at um, promoting housing, second story and third story housing uh, in, in, in village centers. Uh, so there's sort of a lot of movement around, uh, around this. Um, but I like to kind of come back to like, all right, there's 197 units in Orleans, and I think in Toronto we need 56. And I, I think th th this number, I think, um, I, I found helpful in really kind of thinking about, okay, what, what does this mean? Uh, for, for the community, um, I, I think, and, and, and the ability to do that is very much changed in part through wastewater. If you don't have wastewater, it's harder, especially right. if you're a town like Orleans, to get to that nearly 200. You have greater density. The other, as Julian was talking, the other thing that came to mind is I had a conversation with the town manager in Provincetown recently as well, and um, he was saying, well, you know, if this so-called Airbnb tax, and now we're not talking about the wastewater surcharge part, but just closing the loophole so that all rentals uh, are subject to the room occupancy tax, which, by the way, we're the last state in New England that has not done that, uh, interestingly. Um, uh, so the town of Provincetown right now, there's a certain percentage of the room occupancy tax that goes to fund wastewater, there's a certain percentage that goes into the tourism fund, and then there's a certain percentage that goes into the general fund, and, uh, you know, as he's doing back of the envelope uh, calculations on what the additional revenue will be, he says, you know, we have to look at what those allocations are. And they did that by legislation. Prior to my time, Rep. Shirley Gomes uh, filed that legislation for them. Um, uh, w we may be sending you a new bill allocating and, and you know, maybe reducing some of the tourism share part because the total pot's going to be bigger and then allocating some, directing it towards affordable housing, towards the affordable housing trust fund. So that's also a, a way to think about it as well. Uh, Julian, we had talked a little bit about the um, Nantucket yep. uh, transfer tax. Um, and ironically, in Orleans, we actually asked our assessor uh, the, over the last three years the number of properties that sold in the excess of two and a half million, which was the number that Nantucket was using. Such a transfer in Orleans would have generated $153,000. So there are a number of significant sales. 
Is there a blueprint for a community to follow, file a special home rule message to allow for a transfer tax that could fly below the radar, if you will? <laughs> because these things are obviously, yeah, yep. it goes way back, yep. even with the Cape Cod Land Bank, the realtors were opposed to it initially. They That's all right. thought it was going to impact uh, sales, and lo and behold, it hasn't. The Community Preservation Act really hasn't had right. the, the type of it. But, you know, having a source of revenue that isn't coming from the taxpayer that is here now that we're asking to fund all of these other things, yeah. if there was a way in doing it at a tra as a transfer, either a goodbye tax or a hello, you know, that, that might be an easier way to dedicate a revenue stream to a trust fund if we go that route at town meeting. Um, anything that you could help us with as far as a, a blueprint as to what you've seen up at the legislature that may be acceptable uh, yep. that, that we could use, that would be very helpful. C certainly glad to share that. I think we'll, um, our colleague Dylan Fernandez, who represents Nantucket in the House, uh, has actually done a really impressive job in moving the Nantucket home rule pretty far. Uh, further than I think I expected, it's currently in bills and third reading in the House, right. which is sort of like the, 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 the last piece where it would go the last to the choke floor. Point. The last <laughs> um, Before February 7th, right? Yeah. No, it, it, no, can, no. it, it can sit there forever. Oh, okay. Yeah, till next uh, January 2nd. But, uh, um, so glad to sit, share some okay. templates. I'm Good. hopeful that over the next several weeks and months, there'll be some more lessons learned um, from both the Nantucket example and then I think Provincetown. Um, right. You know, and, and, and if there's some hybrid of that, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but we're glad to assist on that. I can have but my that would be follow. helpful, because I think as we, uh, the board looks to go to town meeting in May, these funding options scenarios, if it requires a home rule message, the time to get it in is to do it in uh, this winter to put it in a warrant right. for the spring. Right, that would yeah. make sense. And, and I will say, um, I think based on my many conversations now with the lieutenant governor, she's been down on the Cape a number of times, we all met with her here, and hearing what the governor, uh, what I read that he says in the State House News or, or in the Boston Globe, they both come from local government. They both served in boards of selectmen. And uh, there may be an openness to allowing towns to, if town meeting votes it up and says, yes, that is the will of town meeting. It's an idea that the selectmen have brought to town meeting and it's passed. So I, I think we have an opportunity uh, this session and then, uh, you know, rolling forward to um, to look at these things with with fresh eyes, it's not necessarily a rubber stamp. No, it's going into the trash can. It, okay. you want, go ahead. Well, you do yours. I'll do the last. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I just wanted I just wanted to go back to uh, uh, Orleans and wastewater for a bit because there's another issue. Uh, We've been spending a lot of time trying to see if we can use natural processes to reduce nitrogen, right. and that's aquaculture. And, um, you know, we've had this pilot in Lonnie's Pond uh, for a year and a half now. Um, we're into the se well into the second year. And I think we've had quite a bit of success, and enough success so that the Mass Municipal Association has just given us an award for that project. Congratulations. Uh, and uh, so, but one of the things that we've discovered as we've gone down this road is that some of the thinking at the state regulatory level yeah is a little old-fashioned <coughs> and I hope that as we get into this trying to figure out how we move these things around how we dispose of them who can grow with them and so forth right. if we need help at the regulatory level you'll be there to help us absolutely yep. and this is something that um, the town manager and I had, had talked about I believe we may have actually even reached out to the Division of Marine Fisheries right. the chokehold for you folks is that um, currently how uh, the regulatory structures for the uh, shelling, the, the selling of shellfish, uh, wholesale uh, dealing of that um, <clears throat> is uh, through individuals or through cooperatives and, and not through municipality. Um, I actually, in, in a prior life, worked pretty closely with the Division of Marine Fisheries on a whole list of public health issues. Uh, and so I'll follow up in my office. I know this is something we mm -hmm. talked about, um, but providing a menu of options for the town, uh, e even if it is. Um, there's, there's a whole host of menu of options. Um, you know, I, I do know that. Uh, there's only one town in the Commonwealth that actually allows wild harvest of oysters, and that's in uh, Wellfleet. Uh, I don't know if that's a way forward. I don't know if a more direct uh, transfer and wholesale. As you well know, it requires um, a tremendous amount of cultivation to actually get the 
uh, oysters to absorb as much nitrogen as possible. Uh, and then it doesn't count until <laughs> the oysters are actually <laughs> removed. <laughs> um, so, 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 so we'll work on that and follow up on that. Uh, but I think something we can, um, you are probably the first town to be doing this and certainly not the last. And so we'll work with the Division of Marine Fisheries at, le at least to um, try to find out some sort of temporary path forward and then have them look at, uh, look at it more broadly. Um, before John has the last one, I just wanted to touch base with you on um, something that one of you alluded to much earlier tonight. I think just uh, I know some of the smaller towns out in the western part of the state, and, and particularly uh, Wachusett region, is um, trying to move forward some initiative in terms of dealing with full funding of regional transportation for school yes. districts, yes. regional school districts, yes. which is something that I know the Nauset district has, has been yeah. looking at for yeah. years and years and years. And I think we've always kind of fallen victim to that notion that yeah. you're an affluent community on Cape Cod, you don't need that yeah. funding, even though we were encouraged to regionalize way back when uh, with this carrot of we'll give you 100% right. or up to 100% I right. think was the way the language was written. Right. <laughs> it's always written that way. A, a, letter, <laughs> a, a, a letter was um, just circulated around the House which I signed on to to uh, the Chair of Ways and Means um, reminding him of, uh, re respectfully, but reminding him of this commitment to 100% regional school transportation and that this is something we're looking for. I know here in this district and on the Cape in general, um, you know, a lot of people talk about trying to change the Chapter 70 funding formula. It was tweaked six or so years ago, so that it's not purely based on uh, what your real estate value is, but it does take a snapshot at income, but it is still patently unfair. Uh, to change that formula in a very significant way is a very it's impossible, really, unless there's a big new chunk of cash, because there would be winners and losers. And the losers would be in big places like Boston, where right. they have a lot of reps and senators. Um, but ways that we can impact rural areas is through funding regional school transportation, for example. Uh, SPED circuit breaker <coughs> funds, that's money that comes directly into the district based on a per student uh, cost. So those are all things that Senator Sierra and I, uh, during the budget time, uh, really focus on and, and push hard for and, and, and work on, on on behalf of all of our communities. I, I think on education and, and to Sarah's point about uh, unlikely that we're going to do much until there's a new sort of big pot of change. Uh, one thing that, that, that may happen, uh, there's an initiative on the ballot, the 2018 ballot, that would change, uh, basically change our ability to have different uh, tax rates when it comes to income. Uh, this is the, what's called the fair share amendment, would tax millionaires and billionaires at a higher rate. Um, if that goes through, uh, if the voters pass that, um, we're looking at an additional billion plus of revenue. Uh, in the ballot initiative, it's allegedly dedicated to education and to infrastructure. Um, I suspect that would spur a conversation on our end uh, if indeed uh, that happens and if indeed it is tied to education uh, in some way. I think to looking at in the winter of 2019, uh, what, you know, I, I think this is a conversation I'm anticipating uh, and I think certainly would look towards uh, communities uh, and any conversation there can be kind of having, you know, having maybe just several times through 2018 to look and see, all right, you know, if, if the Cape is going to make a, if, if we're going to hope for something additional, you know, what is that and what is that that we push for? And it may very well be regional uh, transportation funding. Um, it may be other things in uh, the foundation budget review recommendations, but I think just keep keep that in mind. I think to 2019, if that does happen, um, then that may spur our ability to, to uh, provide additional resources, and, and, and we may okay. move on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, what we've done here is we've done a pretty good overview of what's going on, but more specifically for Orleans, we've worked very hard to have several projects with different components come to fruition at the same time. Um, for example, the D DOT is going to redo our intersections and our Main Street downtown. We voted to do some sewer work on that same project that the town is funding so we can get that done at the same time. We've made some major changes in 
um, uh, density for downtown, mm -hmm. especially in, in the village center district. So we can work on getting more housing downtown and in particular affordable housing. So we're putting all of these things together. We're trying to get the D DEP to approve our experiment, uh, which we've footed the bill for, which others will be able to take advantage of, assuming that it's successful. And it looks like it's going to be successful. But the big thing is all the regulations and the permits and all of this thing stretches the cost and the time to do mm -hmm. these things out. We would hope that the legislature would work on streamlining the permitting yes. process for everything. We talked about underground uh, utilities downtown until we found out you have to have a permit for every person that's on the pole. Mm -hmm. And it takes forever to get all those permits and they want their, their line here and these guys want their line mm -hmm. there and it's become so complicated you just can't dig a hole and put the line underground. Mm. Right. So my request to you is with Orleans, with all of these arms coming to fruition and very soon, mm -hmm. you know, I'm talking next couple of years, that we can get the permits we need to do the things we need to do to improve the environment, improve right. the uh, economy, and allow people to have a better <coughs> chance at life here in Orleans if we don't get bogged down in permits. So the legislature needs to start talking to some of these, uh, you know, the DPUs, the DEPs, and all of those about streamlining their permit procedure. I have to say, as a result of the 208 process, that the DEP with new people there have really taken a serious look at the <coughs> watershed mm -hmm. permit which you mentioned, and they're, and then taking a serious look at it. But we got to get past the look right. and get into action. Right. Yeah. And that's what I'm looking for from you, our representatives, is <coughs> we're kind of looking at stuff. It's taken years to get somewhere. We're almost there. Don't let us get bogged down in excessive permitting. Paperwork. Right. Yeah. And I think when you have specific examples of that, mm -hmm. uh, please share that with us, because mm -hmm. uh, I think those stories are, are, are potent both in, uh, one, specifically addressing you know, an issue, um, and then more broadly looking at, well, well how do you fix that, right? If, if, DP, if, if the DPU regulations are such that it's just prohibitive um, to be looking at, you know, when, when you're opening up the street, you, know, you should be doing that all at once. Uh, right. We haven't been doing that. Um, that also can prompt us to think and look at, all right, what legislation would need to be changed or, or, or how do you further incentivize it? So it's sort of a both, a both and there, but I think make sure that, that we're aware of it. Um, well, could, the, yeah. the big thing I see is that this regular, regulator has these rules and this regulator has these rules and, and sometimes they're in other. conflict mm -hmm. with each right. other. Yeah. Right. They, need, they need to talk to each other. Or have there be a common permit that's good at DPU and good at DEP. And maybe there's a, like a, a one-page add-on, uh, more mm -hmm. environmental for one and more energy-related for the other or whatever it might be. Right. Well, right. we found in some of our dealings, you know, especially in, with utility things, that they just don't talk to each other. Well, utilities. But, you know, but that, that's a special issue, and, and <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get into a yeah. detail on that. Yeah. Yep. We're, we're working our way through that issue as best we can. Yeah. But Orleans is on the cusp of, of having a lot of things happen at the same time, and we'd like to be as efficient as possible <coughs> with less expense and less time spent at it. Right. Any other questions or comments? Well, I thank you very much for coming down and taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank and you. And you can be assured that uh, as things move along, we'll keep you apprised of what Orleans is doing or Please what do. Orleans has had trouble doing. Right. And, and a happy and healthy New Year to all of you as well. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>